so I like to say that I help make doctors into better feminists. I'm Jill Angelo, host of the Genev podcast series for women's health in midlife. I speak with the most forward thinking experts in the health and wellness industries. These experts are helping women 40 plus feel confident and in control of their health in the most vibrant years of their lives. So join us on this journey of women's health. Bianca Pomazano is a sex educator and medical consultant and is the owner of Intimate Health Consulting. Pomazano got her start as a case manager working with the homeless population of Washington, D.C. She is a Planned Parenthood certified sex educator and a two-time presenter for the Philadelphia Transgender Health Conference. I met Pomazano at an industry conference for OBGYNs, and I was intrigued by her train-the-trainer approach to sexual education and wellness for doctors, nurses, and medical professionals. What makes her so unique is that she is reaching women, LGBTQ and transgender communities, through the physicians and health providers they look to for sexual health guidance. Uh, you know, one thing that you've mentioned a lot um, on your website, which is intimate health consulting, you you talk a little bit about sex positivity and um, the notion that, you know, sex is healthy and we should be able to talk about it openly o- openly, uh, and, and really, you know, address the need for pleasure and its health impacts in our in our lives. How do you see that being accepted? Is it generally starting to be something that we talk about? it is starting to see purchase in in the the what do we call it the 2010s i guess is really um where i've seen sex positivity sort of picking up steam and obviously your mileage varies an awful lot based on where you're living um you know there are communities that i think are on the cutting edge of um, talking about sex and sexuality in a way that's affirming and recognizing that pleasure is a positive thing. Um, we see that a lot in uh, in the sex ed community, in the BDSM community, um, in certain, uh, in, in subsections of the feminist community, especially in like black feminist communities. Um, but, you know, I am very cognizant of the fact that there are still lots of people living in rural Idaho for whom the idea of sex before marriage is, uh, absolutely soul shattering and that it, it feels like it's a, it's going to ruin their reputation. So we still have that incredibly broad spectrum of experiences in the U.S., All right. Well, speaking of sex positivity, uh, you know, we at Genev, we think about women in midlife and how hormonal change in our health impacts all facets of our bodies and our minds and our health overall. And um, a sexual health is obviously a big part of that. Uh, what are you? What are some general things you're seeing from a sexual wellness and education perspective in the women's community for women just midlife and and even those heading into menopause or having come through it? I'm seeing two very positive trends uh, uh, when it comes to talking about women at midlife and and situations around menopause. And I I'm so grateful that Genev is also tackling this topic and really trying to make a space for women to experience midlife sexuality in as positive a way as possible. So one of the things I'm seeing is on the actual medical and pharmacological side. Um, I just got back from the ACOG conference, the American Congress on Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and they had uh, a great number of presentations and medical interventions that were talking about women at midlife and specifically how to deal with menopausal symptoms and the way that that impacts our sexual health. So things around... um, Uh, hormone replacement therapy and vaginal suppositories that would make sex less painful that's going to help rejuvenate that tissue um, in the genital area and and sort of make sex something that um, doesn't have to be 
a, a declining factor with with menopause. So I think that having more options in the toolkit is definitely a positive thing uh, for women at midlife. The other positive trend is more and more um, sex educators are talking about um, sex at midlife. Uh, one of my favorite, or I have a couple of favorites actually, um, folks who are who are talking about that and really about helping women understand the way that their body changes so that it's not a scary thing and it's not uh, a change that they're fighting, but something that can be uh, a positive experience for them. Um, so uh, Joan Price is a fantastic educator and author. She wrote the book Naked at Our Age, um, and she really covers aging as you go past menopause and into um, later life. Um, I also have a wonderful colleague in Virginia named uh, Walker Thornton, who um, similarly talks about uh, women as they age, but more in the, I think, in the 40 to 40 to 55, 40 to 60 range. Um, and what it means to go through life changes as well as physical changes at that time point. So what does it mean if you are um, experiencing divorce or the loss of a partner? What does it mean to um, experience a, a coming of age in sexuality later in life? Um, people who discover that they may not be straight after a very long marriage um, and I think there is fabulous conversation happening about all of the experiences that women go through. How would you kind of counsel a woman around either bringing up the discussion with her doctor or with her healthcare provider? Well, unfortunately, the trend is traditionally don't talk about it. Um, so I, my feelings are no matter who brings it up, just somebody should. Um, so I... I do some patient education and advocacy work where I help women talk about how to bring these conversations up with their providers, and it involves strategies like making a list beforehand and doing some cognitive rehearsal so that if the doctor tries to brush your concerns aside, you are prepared to sort of reassert yourself. And obviously we want to live in a world where that doesn't happen where all providers take patients' concerns very seriously and give them the time that they deserve. But I help patients sort of prepare for the worst case scenario. And then on the other side of the spectrum, my, my heart's work is really with providers to help them be able to proactively have these conversations. Because when we talk about sexuality, I very firmly believe that it shouldn't be a reactive response where, oh no, there's a problem, we're going to fix it now, um, but rather that we should be able to have conversations before problems arise so that we can help patients continue at their optimal level of functioning so that they are having happy and uh and enjoyable sex lives and that we don't need a lot of medical intervention on the back end. Um, so for me, that means having uh, more effective sexual history taking techniques um, and making sure that providers are just comfortable asking questions that cover not just mm, when was your last period and, um, you know, uh, are you having sex with men, women, or both? But, you know, are your experiences pleasurable? Are you concerned for your safety at all? What is What are your relationships like? Digging into some of those um, quality of life measures that really make the difference for women in their lives and their relationships. Personally, I'm not going to likely schedule an appointment with my doctor um, to talk about my sexual health. It's it's not something that comes to mind as a just a typical, you know, 40 plus woman, um, even if sex isn't just quite as enjoyable as it has been in the past. Uh, so how would you uh, advise women to start to just get educated or even be aware that there's a better way? Honestly, my favorite part about doing my work with professionals is that when individuals say, well, talking to 
my doctor isn't really the route that I want to pursue, I can then recommend them to hundreds of other incredible resources because your doctor is a great source of knowledge, but they are not the only source of knowledge and certainly not the only place that you can go to have these conversations. So I have, you know, a little black book full of wonderful sex educators who do one-on-one coaching with individuals who want to tackle changes to their sexuality in midlife. I have, um, resources for social workers, for therapists, for um, uh, uh, pelvic floor therapists, the whole range of professionals that, that might be the right kind of support for, um, for an individual who, who wants to have these conversations. And, you know, there's also a great deal of solid information available online. And I love what Genev is doing to create a community where women can talk about these issues online. So I think it definitely doesn't have to be just, you know, I'm going to sit down for 20 minutes with my doctor and that's going to fix all of my problems. There are so many other ways that this can be tackled. And, you know, just kind of uh, understanding, you know, the notion of sexual health competency, you know, in your field, you look at sexuality very differently than most of us do. You know, I think in, in fact, for most people, sex is highly personal. It's a private matter. We don't think about it much beyond our bedrooms. Um, but you take it so much broader and look at the cultural view of sex and, sex and, and sexuality Uh, Can you tell us, you know, what level of awareness is necessary and important important for, you know, a a medical provider to know to even help their patients? I tell my providers when I do trainings all the time that you do not have to be an expert in all things sexuality to be effective in having these conversations. I have a slide that lists like all of the different elements of sexuality that somebody could have like in-depth proficiency in. And it's a lot of material. And I don't expect that of every, every healthcare provider that I talk to. What it really comes down to is knowing how to have conversations in a way that puts your baggage on the back shelf. Every healthcare provider comes into their practice with some, with some baggage, with, Um, All of the things that they have been told about sexuality throughout their lifespan from their parents, from their peers, from their schooling, both professional and, you know, the really atrocious uh, K through 12 sex ed that some of us were lucky enough to get. Um, All of that shapes their assumptions about what healthy sexuality looks like. And it's really hard to to sort of set those aside and say, well, but this is what my patient wants. This is what they define as normal. And this is what they feel like they need. So I really try to help practitioners develop that basis of understanding of sexuality, the one where they can put away all of their assumptions and really focus on what's central to their patient's needs. Well, let's uh, switch to the side of relationships and what you know, good sex does for a relationship, Um, especially, again, focusing on kind of women in midlife health, um, just because it's kind of our sweet spot (laughs) as the Genev community. Uh, Bianca, can you tell us a little bit about how you address sexual health and relationships and, and how that really helps a relationship be healthier and more fulfilling? I feel like sex and relationships are the this mutually reinforcing um, dynamic where you have a healthy relationship, you're likely to have healthier and better sex. You have healthier and better sex, it's going to feed closeness and strengthen a relationship. Um, so there is it's it's a crucial component for a lot of people in what feels like keeping a dynamic relationship going. And I know that for many people in midlife, this is a time when maybe they've been with their partner for um, over a decade and um, your body has changed, your relationship has evolved, maybe you have kids, maybe you have a mortgage, maybe you have um, debts to deal with. There can be a lot of stresses coming on in midlife and we don't often think about the way that that impacts 
our sexuality um, and, and our relationship with our partners. We want to believe that sexuality sits as sort of its own component over there in a box by the by the bedside and we just pull it out when it's useful to us. But in reality, it's so integrated with the rest of the life that we're living that when we're not addressing those stresses that come with day-to-day life, um, it can have very serious impacts on our sexuality. So how does, a, how does a woman start that conversation with her partner? Each relationship is going to have a, a strategy that makes sense for them. But I guess the main takeaway I have for people is to do it in a low stress environment. So you're not having a conversation about sexuality, like as you are pulling out the condoms and getting ready to get busy in the like, you know, 10 minutes before, um, Johnny comes home from soccer practice or whatever. Um, some people like to do that via email or text messages or Facebook messenger because it provides a little bit of safety in, in the distance um, and people can respond at their own leisure and without feeling the pressure to say exactly the right thing because your partner is staring you down saying like, okay, this is very important. I've been sitting on this for six months. You better, you better have a good answer for me. But that could also happen via a leisurely conversation over breakfast or on a long car ride to go visit the in-laws or, you know, it's, it's going to be different for, for everyone. But I think making space for it in a way that's low pressure is really important. You mentioned earlier this notion of coming of age later in life, and you see that within women who get to know themselves better and their bodies better. Can you talk a little bit about that and some of the, some of the, um, just uh, what that means and how women might think about it? There are different ways that that could go down, but I find that for a lot of folks, um, we have this very clear trajectory of what a successful life looks like for a woman up till about the time that their kids go away to college. So, you know, you you find your partner, you get your successful career, you start climbing, you get the house, you get the kids, uh, maybe you get the dog, and you you nurture that beautiful family and somehow manage to juggle your career at the same time. And then you, you've succeeded, the kids are, are real human beings and they're going off to start their own lives And you look around at your house and your marriage and your life and you say, well, now that I have a second to breathe, is this actually what suits me? And sometimes that means looking more critically at the relationship that they have had with their partner over the past decade or so. Sometimes it means saying, you know, I really need to invest in myself and in some Uh, hobbies or passions that I really care about um, now that I am not a mother uh, 100% of the time. Sometimes it's realizing that they had shut themselves off to um, other opportunities or or different ways of being, whether that's, you know, being Uh, realizing that they're part of the LGBTQ community or that they're interested in BDSM or something else that they were told they're not supposed to be as they were growing up. And it was simply easier to fall into the, the standard narrative of what a woman's life looks like. So I think that that midlife time period has all these possibilities for women because suddenly they have a moment to step back and assess what they actually want from their lives. And sexuality can be a huge piece of that. So I consider midlife a very exciting time. Yeah, that's great. You know, I think there's so much um, positive kind of, uh, there's a positive notion about what you talked about in terms of midlife being such an exciting time around discovering who we are and what role our sexual health and, and sexual wellness and desire plays into all of that. And it's it's wonderful to be bringing you directly to consumers and listeners today, Bianca. Thank you. You can find more on my conversation with Bianca Pomazano on our website at www.genev.com.
and stay tuned for my talk with one of the pioneers of naturopathic medicine, Jane Giltonen, and how her hippie years of living in San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district led her to one of the most respected schools for naturopathic medicine in the United States. Thanks for listening to the Genev podcast series. We welcome your feedback at Genev.com. That's G-E-N-N-E-V-E dot com. You can follow us on Facebook and subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher and you'll never miss an episode. The Genev podcast series is produced by Shannon Perry. Theme music by Smitty. And until next time, watch the Genev website for new stories and offers all dedicated to women's midlife health. <laughs>